I said to you last week in a very long introduction, and tonight will be a little bit of a long introduction as well, just getting right to our point, that Jeremiah's, Jeremiah's ministry spanned over five kings. His ministry began under Josiah, who was a good king. Josiah died in battle, in a battle he should have never gone into, against the king of Egypt, Pharaoh Necho. The people decided they needed a new king, and so they decided to raise up the son of, the son of Josiah, one of his sons. His, son, his son's name was Shalom. We know him as Shalom. He was also known as Jehoiada. Pharaoh Necho found out about this and said, well, I don't want him as king. And he just basically removed, he removed Jehoiada or Shalom from being king and took him down to Egypt where he would live out the rest of his life. Pharaoh Necho decided, well, I'm going to put it somebody else. And he said, he said, I'll make one of the, one of the, one of the other sons, uh, one of the brothers of Shalom, Je one of Jehoiada's brothers king, and he made Jehoiakim king. And Jehoiakim wound up being king for 11, 11 years. Jehoiada was king for three months. Jehoiakim became king for about 11 years. And Jehoiakim was a very stubborn king and a king who the Bible just, who shed much innocent blood. We'll see some of that again tonight. Who shed much innocent blood in the land of Judah, in the city of Jerusalem. He was a king that promoted and encouraged uh, idol worship. Uh, he was an oppressive king. He did not do justice. When Babylon, Babylon came in and started take, taking captives out of Jerusalem slowly there, uh, and they required a taxation of the people. He said uh, Nebuchadnezzar required a, a heavy tribute from the, from the hand of Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim passed it on to the people and uh, taxed them on mercifully with gold and silver for all those things. And, and so bad was his reign that we, we read last week where God told, uh, told Jehoiakim through Jeremiah that he would have the death of the common people. In fact, he would just be thrown in a garbage heap and he would just be, have the burial of a donkey. I mean, it's how bad it was. Well, Jehoiakim came off, came up, uh, his, his reign was, was finished, and they, there was a, he had a son by the name of Jeconiah. He's called Jeconiah or Kenai in the book of, of, of Jeremiah. He was also known as Jehoiachin, and you read 2 Kings and over 2 Chronicles, he's known as Jehoiachin, and he came to reign, but he only reigned for three months, and Nebuchadnezzar came and took Jeconiah, or Kaniah, he took him, down, took him up, to, up to Babylon, there he would live out the rest of the days of his life, he would be a captive there, and several other people went up there, Jeconiah went up there, so I want you to bear in mind, as the background of what we're going to study tonight, Jeconiah is now in Babylon. Because we're going back and forth between Jehoiakim and Zedekiah, but as we get, we look a little bit further tonight, chapter 27 transitions to from, it just kind of jumps us from, from Jehoiakim's reign all the way to Zedekiah's reign. And of course, the last king was Zedekiah, who also was a, was a king given much admonition by God, but did not follow any of the word of God. And Zedekiah wound up uh, having his eyes gouged out by, by Nebuchadnezzar and seeing all of it before he had his eyes gouged out, he saw his sons slain in front of him and just he saw the, the, the city just go through pillage and burned and all these things, things that could have been avoided had he listened to this prophecy that was given here in chapter 27 of Jeremiah. All of Jeremiah's messages were marked by very colorful symbols. Right in the beginning of his preaching, we find the symbol of a fountain of living water. He used the symbol of fallow ground. He used twice the symbol of the potter and the clay. Symbols that they can understand. Uh, over in chapter 23, he used the symbols of fire and a hammer to describe the word of God. He, he used the description of marriage to describe, he used the symbol of marriage to describe the relationship of God with his people. In Jeremiah 25, he used the symbol of a cup to describe the fury and the wrath of God. And here in tw chapters 27 and 28, it's not the first time because we find it earlier, he uses 12 different times the symbols of the yoke and the bonds to drive home a principle, to drive home some things that were very important to God. I want us to consider this evening the matter of the yoke. Notice, first of all, this evening, the prophecy. Verse 1, as we read, it began, it was at the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, year number one of Jehoiakim. God comes to Jeremiah. Make thee bonds and yokes of wood and put them on thy neck. What is a yoke? We tried to get one for today as an object illustration. I don't have one. I don't know if we have a, I don't have an image of any kind. Here we go. 
A yoke is a wooden cross beam laid on the necks of two bulls or oxen. And through this on the back, they're attached to a plow or a cart. The yoke, those, those two circular items you see there are the bonds or the bands that was being spoken of here. It attached a wooden beam around their neck. This was so that oxen could successfully plow a field or pull a wagon. A yoke was a necessary farming instrument so fields could be plowed. Farmers did not want to be plowing it with, with human strength. They realized they could accomplish more, get more done. If they had two sturdy, strong animals that have yoke. There are two oxen we saw in Costa Rica. We were down there preaching for a mission trip several years ago. Those two oxen, my wife and I saw, I thought a picture of that. I said, one of these days this will be a sermon illustration. Sure enough, for tonight it winds up being one. Amen. They would plow fields and they would pull wagons. Typically, oxen and bulls would have to be very similar in size and weight to pull this so there would be, there would be parity. The bonds tied everything together. God told Jeremiah, I want, you to make these I want you to make this. So he had this image in mind, just very similar to the one we saw in the first frame. He had this image in mind of a, of a cross beam where he would, have, he would make it. We fit it to his neck. Every, every one of these, these cross beams were somewhat custom fitted to fit around the neck of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the animal so that it would not be too loose or to be too tight and so that it would not fall off and so that the, the animal, even though it was heavy, they could tolerate it and they could start pulling together as they started to plow the field. God told Jeremiah, I want you to make you some wooden, uh, wooden yokes and wooden bond, uh, some wooden yokes and leather bonds. He said, you're going to put on your neck and then you're going to make others and you're going to send it to the kings of, of Ammon and Tyre and Zidon and so forth. And then you're ultimately going to send one to Zedekiah, the king of Judah. I want you to make these bonds of yoke. These bonds, if you would, uh, were, gave the idea as, as the Jews saw Jeremiah put this on his neck. You can imagine this, the senior, a very awkward, very, very strange looking scene. Jeremiah, wearing this yoke with a bond around him. Now, as I think about it, it, the Bible doesn't say so, but it could very well be that Jeremiah had someone else next to him who carried the second side of that to support. Otherwise, it would be very awkward and be hanging down. Otherwise, it would just be probably one single yoke with just with a bond around it. I have the idea that it may have been, it may have been a yoke that allowed for two individuals there because that was the idea that the, that the Jews had. That all being said, the Jews, as they saw this, because Jeremiah didn't wear that for one day. Jeremiah, as we read our story here, Jeremiah 27, 28, it is likely that Jeremiah may have, may have worn this for 14 years. Now back in those days, the preachers were the object illustrations. I'm thankful it's not like that today, amen? I don't know if God told me to go around naked, I don't know if I'd want to do that, amen, you know? I mean, just some of the things they were told to do there. I mean, just really, just, you know, God, I think God has a sense of humor about how he does things, but he had to drive home a point. And being part of an agricultural society, everybody, everybody that saw this knew what a yoke was. They knew what the bonds for. And they, they knew that animals, this was just a farming instrument. Everybody took for granted. They plowed together. They shared the burden. They did this together. Now, the, the yoke in this case symbolized the coming of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and his besieging of the country. We just read that here in chapter 27. The yoke in this situation was, was symbolized the coming of Nebuchadnezzar and the besieging of the nations. That's what it's talking about there. Nebuchadnezzar was the uncontested king who would bring many nations under his reign. And so you can imagine here Jeremiah wearing this. The yoke represented to each of them as he's preaching this message. It represented to them this, this, this symbol was the bondage of servitude. That they would be in bondage to Nebuchadnezzar. They would be in bondage to, to, to uh to Babylon. And of course, that didn't register very well with the Jews because the very first time, the very first few times we have the word yoke mentioned in the Bible, it refers to the, the yoke of bondage that the Jews were under when they were back in Egypt. Remember that? They were in Egypt and in slavery there for 440 years or so. And so when God mentioned that they were under the yoke of bondage to the Egyptians, it brought back very, some scars and some memories and, and some terrible thoughts of being under bondage there. So the idea of being under bondage to Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon did not fit very well. Everybody knew Babylon 
Babylon was the rising power. Everyone knew, and they watched as Babylon would defeat Assyria, and they watched as, as Babylon became greater, and they conquered nation after nation after nation, and they were, they were a northern nation way up fat, uh, from them where the Euphrates River was, and they would eventually make their way down. It was a thousand mile journey to come down there to where Jerusalem. So Jerusalem thought, well, we're the city on a hill, and we're very well insulated. Maybe they won't bother us. But God gives us prophecy here, and he tells them, he says, listen, what I want you to do, Jeremiah, I want you to put, I want you to make yokes of wood and, a bond, and bonds, uh, leather bonds. And they said, I want you to put that around your neck and you're going to go and preach this message. You're going to tell the children of Judah and you're going to tell the people, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And specifically, you're going to tell the princes and the priests and the prophets. He says, now all this symbolizes one thing. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come down and he's going to take all of you into servitude and he's going to take control of this. But here's what I want you to do. He's going to take control, but I don't want you to buck him. And I don't want you to fight him and I don't want you to leave. And he says, don't, don't leave. Just stay here in the city. If you stay here, it's, your, it's my will that you, this happens to you. I mean, God, God did this, if you would, as a chastening of, of, Jer- of Jerusalem and Judah there. But he says, I don't want you to leave. I want you to stay there. He says, if you stay there, it'll be well with thee. In fact, we'll, we'll see this in a future message. God said, it's for your good. To what he said in chapter 20, 24, he said, it's for your good. And he, so he said, there, I want you to do this there. And, and, uh, and, he, and, and the verse we closed off in our reading notice, verse 12 says, bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon. Serve him and his people and ye shall live. You know, to be in servitude to another foreign nation doesn't fit very well with anybody. But God asked the follow-up question. He said, why will you die? He says, because if you don't do that, then you're out of my will. And if you don't do that, what's going to happen to you? I'm going to send the sword and the pestilence and famine, and maybe you're going to die by that. It'll just make the hand of Nebuchadnezzar more harsh against you there. And so he tells them they need to wear this. So here's Jeremiah walking around for 14 years wearing this here. And, and he goes on further there. Uh, notice the latter, the latter part of chapter 27. He goes on by telling them that, that the nation did not submit themselves to, the, to them, that they would be punished there. And he says, now Nebuchadnezzar, when he does all these things, this is not only going to be, he's only going to put you in bondage, but later on he's going to come back and he's going to invade the temple. And when he invades the temple, he's going to take out the molten sea. Remember you read about that before in your Bible? He's going to take away the molten sea and he's going to take away the pillars. And he's going to take something else. He's going to take the, the vessels of gold and silver, these consecrated vessels that go back many years before, back to Solomon's reign. He says he's going to take those consecrated vessels that were for the worship of God and the pouring out, of, con, pouring out of, of water and things there on the altar. He says he's going to take some of those vessels as well. Now you've got to remember, this is in the first year of Jehoiakim. That sounds very far-fetched. Keep your finger there. This is not in your notes. Go with me to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. Everything Jeremiah was preaching and prophesying occurred in the third year of Jehoiakim's reign. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Jerusalem, and he besieged it. That's what God said was going to happen. And when this happened here, now we read this in Daniel chapter 1, Jeremiah is still wearing this yoke of wood and these bonds around his neck. And we read here in verse 1, it says here, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, and he besieged it. They couldn't do anything about it because he did. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, notices, with part of the vessels of the house of God. If you go back, I don't have time to read it, if you go back to chapter 27, that's exactly what God said would happen in verses 17 to 22. Not only did he take the vessels of the house of God, he carried into his land of Shinar to the house of his God. He brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And he also brought certain of the children of Israel, of the king's seed and of the princes. Now that was prophesied during the reign of Hezekiah, and this was fulfilled during the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim. God is fulfilling what he said he's going to do. Hey, don't mock God's word. God, when God says he's going to do something, he's going to do something. Amen? Every word of God is pure. And in between this, if you look at this passage of Scripture here, in between all this, these false prophets which outnumber Jeremiah, by the way, false prophets always outnumber God's men. Yeah. 
They're all on television right now. Go on tonight, you'll watch Creflo Dollar, false prophet. Joel Austin, false prophet. Okay? But I love Joel Austin. Turn it off. And don't send your offerings to him. Oh. It's happened the third year. Now go to chapter 28. I'll give you background, then we're, we're going to write into our, what, the application in just a minute. The Lord fast forwards the passage here in chapter 28, verse 1. It came to pass the same year, the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah. Wow. That's 11 years and three months later. And actually not in his first year. It's at the fourth year in the fifth month of Zedekiah. You do the math. Jeremiah has been wearing this yoke maybe as long as 15 years. I said 14 because it says in the beginning of the fourth year and in the fifth month of Zedekiah's reign. Zedekiah was the last king of Judah. And one of, one of, one of, the, one of the things that Jeremiah had to deal with all the time was contesting with the false prophets who'd said, who would say, well, these things aren't going to happen. These aren't going to happen. Well, notice in chapter 28, a prophet gets up by the name of Hananiah. Now, Hananiah is a good name. Daniel had a good friend by the name of Hananiah. The name Hananiah means whom God favors, whom the Lord favors. But this is not the same Hananiah that we read about in Daniel. This is a different Hananiah. Notice what happens here. This Hananiah gets up, and he goes, he looks at, he looks at, he looks, he goes right up to Jeremiah, and he's in the house of the Lord. That's where they're at. They're, they're in church, if you would, and, and before all the priests and all the people. And he goes up, and he looks right at Jeremiah and I, and he says, now, I've got a prophecy I'm going to give you guys. He says, he says, now you mark it down. He says, he says here, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Verse 2. I've broken this yoke, he says, within two full years, because all this, remember now, now we're fast forwarding from the first year of Jehoiakim, then we looked at the third year of Jehoiakim when Nebuchadnezzar came down. And so, so there, there's Kaniah's down there. Kaniah's up there, Jeconiah's up there, and, and Daniel and some of his friends are up there, even though their name's not mentioned there. And the vessels have been taken by, 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 by Nebuchadnezzar. So Hananiah gets up, and you've got to imagine how bold this is, because the city's been encircled now. Zedekiah's king, and the city's been encircled by the Babylonians, and part of the water supply's been cut off, and part of, the, part of their food supply's been affected there. And uh, there is pestilence, there are things going on there, because Zedekiah, as well as the previous kings were fighting, as Jehoiakim was fighting this, Hananiah gets up, because the people are just kind of waiting for something there. Jeremiah said what needed to be said, and he's still walking around with this yoke around his neck there, symbolizing the servitude that they would have to be under, but it represented, just, you just stay put, just till the land, you'll be fine, God will take care of you, this is for your good, stay here, this is God's will for your life, I know it's hard, but this is God's will for your life, you stay there for that. And Hananiah gets up with boldness, he looks at Jeremiah in the face, and Jeremiah's outnumbered because all the princes and the priests and the prophets that are there, they're looking for a good message, I mean, they want to make me feel good, positive message that moment of time. That's how people feel when God's word is being preached preach that time after time and time. Sometimes people don't want to receive the truth. And sometimes people don't want to hear preaching. And sometimes they say, well, give me a feel-good message. I don't want to give you a feel-good message. I want to give you a feel-God message. He says, in two full years, this yoke is going to be broken. I'm going to break this yoke. And listen, I'm going to bring back these vessels. And the vessels are going to come back here. And the, and the captives that were there are going to come back. And Jeconiah is going to come back. Look what he says here. Within two full years will I bring again to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house. The Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried them to Babylon. And he says, and I will bring again to this place Jeconiah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah that went into Babylon, saith the Lord. For I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Well, Jeremiah is standing, there in the court of the, is standing there in the house of the Lord. And I like Jeremiah's attitude. Jeremiah said, okay, amen. So be it. He said, I'm not going to fight with you. 
If God gave you that message, fine. And he goes on by saying this. He says, now I want you to know something. He says, nevertheless, hear thou now this word that I speak in thy ears and the ears of all these people. The prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesied both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and evil and pestilence. He says, now what I've told you, I've had predecessors who preached these same things. By the way, it was Isaiah the prophet, he's probably referred to, Isaiah and Micah the prophet who prophesied about Babylonian captivity many years before. He said, now, the prophets that came before us, they told you these things. They told you these things would come. And he said this in verse 9. The prophet which prophesied the peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord has truly sent him. So he said, I'll tell you what. If there's really peace, then everyone will know that God has sent you. Well, Hananiah didn't take too well to that. Look at verse 10. Hananiah goes up to Jeremiah. He's been wearing this yoke, this yoke of wood for 14 years. We're not sure how sturdy this material was, but, and we're not sure how he did it. But the Bible says in verse 10, he took the yoke off from the prophet Jeremiah's neck and he broke it. And he said once again, thus saith the Lord, even so will I break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. Hey, listen, this guy had to be very dramatic in his preaching. He had to be very, very dramatic. He had to be very animated, dramatic in terms of what he did. He says, listen, I want to make this so dramatic. You understand? So I, he took this yoke off of Jeremiah's neck. And whatever he did, he did, I don't know if he took a, a, an instrument to break it or whatever he did. But he broke it in front of everybody. You could hear the, the smashing and the, and the snapping of this wood breaking apart. And this yoke that had been carried by the prophet Jeremiah mind for 14, almost 15 years. You could see it breaking apart. And everybody's there watches. And Hananiah is being very adamant. He said, thus will in two years, I'll, God will break this, this yoke. He says, Nebuchadnezzar, we're going to get, we're going to get back to the captives. Jeconiah is going to come back here. All these are going to happen. So finally he does all that and he breaks in. So Jeremiah is just quiet. And then we're told a verse or two later, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And he said, sir, I'm going to make yokes of iron for these yokes of wood. Because he says, you're a false prophet, and you've told a lie. You've deceived the hearts of these people. You're telling them something that's not true, and you read the rest of this chapter, and two months, two months after that, Hananiah died for telling a lie about the word of God. A prophecy concerning a yoke speaks of being under the weight of servitude for correction. So then you ask the question, what's that got to do with me? What's the application? Well, notice number two. Would you notice the practical? There's some practical lessons I want to give you tonight, and we're done. About the yoke. The yoke was made of wood. His hand carved to fit the neck, of the animals, or the shoulder of the animal that would wear it, to prevent major discomfort. And yes, in our passage tonight, the yoke is a picture of bondage or servitude. But number one, the yoke is also a picture of suffering and hardship. And the custom fit of the yoke is always a reminder of, to you and me of this one thought. Let's write this down. God never gives you more than you can carry. God never gives you more than you can carry. The yoke is a symbol of suffering and hardship, of the problems and trials God allows into our lives. It reminds you, brother and sister in Christ, with a church that has got many trials and difficulties going on, every trial, every problem, every difficulty we have is always father-filtered. Psalms 119, verse 67 says, Before I was afflicted, before I put on a yoke, I went astray. You know, sometimes God has to give hardship and suffering to us because we've gone astray. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've gone everyone into his own way. When you become independent from God, God might send afflictions into our life to bring us back full circle. 
Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Thank God for the yoke of suffering. It caught him to te- learn the word of God. Later on, he said in verse 71, Psalms 119, verse 71, it is good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Listen, one of the reasons why God sometimes has to put suffering and hardship and affliction in our lives, as much as we don't want it, as much as we despise it, listen, God does it that we might learn his word. You're not going to learn more about God. You're never going to learn about the comforts of God and the greatness of God and the tender mercy of God and trusting God and having faith in God unless we have some of those hardships. 1 Peter 1.7 says, That the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire. Fire burns. It might be found into praise and honor and glory at the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Job 23.10, Job said, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Hey, I like what Spurgeon said. Spurgeon said this, Fiery trials produce golden Christians. Suffering can also include the chastening of the Lord. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. The yoke of Nebuchadnezzar was the yoke of chasing on the people of Judah. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Because Hebrews 12 was written as we have a great explanation of what faith is about and the examples of faith in Hebrews 11. The believers who were drifting, the believers who were having difficulty, they were despising the things of God, that God, they, God had placed them under chastisement, they were being chased in the Lord, and so he had to give them a word of exhortation about chastening. Now maybe you're going through chastening tonight. Either we are going through chastening or we will go through chastening. The Bible has this to say, chastening is good for us. It says this in verse, verse, verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord. The yoke that God puts on you perhaps to correct you, to get you into his word. He says, don't despise it. Despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. That's part of the trial process. That's why God may put a yoke on us. God may put the yoke on us to teach us, to train us, to help us. We're not to despise it. We're not to, we're, not to, we're not to be angry when God rebukes us because he says the Lord does it out of love for us. He says in verse 7, if you endure chastening, that's what the whole chapter is about, about endurance. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But ye, if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Hey, one of the tests of whether or not you're a child of God, if you're not going through chasing, if God isn't chasing you, then the question might be, are you really a child of God? Are you really saved? Have you made a profession, but you don't have the possession? And then the Bible says here later on in verse 9, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father's spirits and live? We're not in subordination to God's leadership, and we're not in submission to God. Sometimes God has to bring chastisement to bring us into that submission, because God loves us. I said God loves us, Amen. No, no, chasing for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous it is. Nevertheless, afterwards, here's the product of chastening. Afterwards, it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down in the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see God. Listen, hardships and difficulties, you have to stop for a minute and just ask God, Lord, is this your chastening so, because you love me? Is there something you're trying to teach me? Lord, is there something you're trying to show me from your word that I've been, have I gone astray? Have I not been in the word of God? Have I not grown in grace? Lord, teach me what you want me to know. The yoke of suffering. Number two, would you notice the yoke of schooling? A yoke of oxen always refers to two oxen harnessed together by the yoke. Together they plow in an even manner. It was very common for farmers as they built out their farm, and I, I want you to imagine Elisha with me in this, because he had 12 yoke of oxen that he was plowing with. It was typical for farmers to pair up an older, experienced ox with a younger, inexperienced ox. Very important for developing the younger oxen who would one day be the elder, the older oxen, and the same thing would be applied to him. He would have a younger oxen next to him. The purpose for putting an older, experienced ox with a younger, inexperienced one is that the restraint of the yoke, the restraint of it, taught the younger ox not to move ahead, move around, move about the older oxen. 
You know, in serving God, it is annoying. It is immaturity. It is unethical to go around, to go ahead, or go about your spiritual leadership. In the same way with parenting and children. It is annoying, it is immature, it is inappropriate and unethical to go ahead, to go around, or go about. So the yoke was used to be a restraint so the oxen would plow together. This would discipline the younger oxen plowing. Now it's a beautiful picture, write this down. It's a beautiful picture of how the discipleship process works. In discipling, an older, experienced, mature believer is yoked with an inexperienced, growing believer. Every one of us, look up here tonight, don't be looking at your notes. Every one of us tonight should have a delight. You may not be participating, but we should, be, we should have a delight and a burden of seeing new, immature believers to be discipled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, the apostle John wrote this, I have no greater joy than to see my children walk in truth, to see them schooled in doctrine, to see them schooled in so many, to see them schooled in the, in, the, in the school of prayer, to see them grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, Moses was yoked to Joshua as part of the discipling process. Elijah was yoked to Elisha as part of the discipling process. Jesus was yoked to his disciples. The disciples of Damascus in the early days of Paul's conversion, they were yoked to the apostle Paul. It took several men because of, because of Paul's stature and because of Paul's knowledge as a Pharisee. It took several men to work with Paul. But I like what I read in Acts chapter 9, verse 9. 19. This is how they were yoked to him. It says, And when he, that is Paul, had received meat, he was strengthened, then was Saul certain days with, with the disciples, which were at Damascus. Listen, you can attribute a lot of the boldness and the courage and a lot of the stability the Apostle Paul got in the early days that led to, his, to him becoming the great Apostle Paul to those disciples there at Damascus who took time with him and strengthened him in the Word of God, strengthened his conviction, taught him how to preach, taught him how to preach biblically, taught him how to defend the faith, taught him who Jesus was, and what Jesus did for him. And to get him up there, and you read the next verse over, Paul got up in synagogues. The Bible says he boldly preached Jesus Christ. Paul was yoked to Timothy and Titus. The apostle John was yoked to a man by the name of Polycarp. Read your church history. Polycarp was one of the great Christians of, as we transition into the, from the first to second century. There. Polycarp was one of the great Christians that, that lived there. He, was the, he wound up being the pastor, I think, of the, of the church at Ephesus. He succeeded the apostle John there, and he was a great Christian there. And, and, he got, and, and, and his stature and his preaching, his boldness for Jesus Christ, all the Caesars hated him. One day they caught Polycarp. They threw him into the arena they wanted to make a shame of him. They wanted to embarrass him. And they threw him in the arena behind Polycarp. As they threw him into the arena behind him were all these Christians that they were eventually going to slaughter. And they told Polycarp, if you want to get set free, you turn around, you turn your back to us, and you look at all those Christians, and you tell them, away with the atheists, away with the atheists, away with the atheists, because they were called atheists because they would not believe in the Roman gods. They said, as far as we're concerned, the real gods are the, are the Roman gods, not the God Jesus who you worship. So you look at those men, and you look at those women, you say, away with the atheists. Polycarp, at 80 years of age, he didn't turn his back on, the, on them. He turned his back to the Christian. He looked at that whole audience there in that stadium that was looking at him, and he said, away with the atheists, away with the atheists. He weighed with the atheists. He didn't turn it on them. He turned against them. That man had his boldness in Jesus Christ because he got it out of the Apostle John. Preachers produce preachers. Mature Christians produce mature Christians. It's the yoke of schooling. The yoke of suffering. Would you notice 2 Corinthians 6 verses 14 to 16? Would you notice the yoke of separation? Second Corinthians 6, verse 14 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What fellowship is righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion is light with darkness? And what conquered is Christ with Belial? What part is he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, when Paul brought this up, everybody he was writing to know what he's talking about. But not being unequally yoked with unbelievers. 
Yoke has its idea, its foundational principle taken from Deuteronomy 22.10. Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together. You put that yoke on an ox and a donkey, you got chaos. Nothing's going to get done. And the idea there is that believers are not to be yoked with unbelievers. Now, one of the great principles of the Christian life that pertains to holiness is our separation from the world, our separation from ungodliness, our separation from things that are sinful there. The Bible says in Amos 3.3, can two walk together except they be agreed? Christians are to be yoked together with believers of like precious faith. Now, I'm a little bit more narrow than that. Like precious faith means same doctrine, same Bible, same philosophy ministry, okay? Now, I preached a whole message on this last, early last year. You can look it up as I, when I preached through 2 Corinthians. I think I preached about 10 messages from 2 Corinthians 6. But we're not to be yoked together, he says in verse 14, with unbelievers, he says, fellowship cannot, righteousness cannot have fellowship with unrighteousness, and communion can, cannot have light with darkness. And let me give you a few guidelines to help you tonight, please. And if you have questions about it, please make an appointment to see me. In the area of dating and marriage, a believer is not to date or to be married with an unbeliever. I know it's hard if you're single. There's no candidates there. But God has not forsaken you. And God's word stands true. Because the yoke of an unbeliever with a believer leads to nothing but heartache and tragedy and sorrow. Don't fall into the trap of being desperate and getting your way. Christians are not to be yoked together with unbelievers in business relationships. Any business relationships. And that would include worldly believers as well. Christians are not to be yoked together with unbelievers in associations and in clubs, hang out in bars, dancing, all that kind of stuff there. You say, well, is that Bible? Yeah, I, that's Bible. I can get into that. As a Christian, we are commanded not to put our name and association alongside of unbelievers where their philosophy and charter conflicts with biblical values. How many of you guys read about this, this, this um, and I may not have all the terminology, so forgive me for this, but about a Bitcoin exchange that, that just filed bankruptcy and all these celebrities have lost money in that thing? Can you imagine the embarrassment some of these celebrities have? I'm not going to mention names if you know what I'm talking about. That put their name out there, that they, they fell for the trap. He just said, you know, would you, be our, would you be our spokesperson? Would you be our ambassador and, and represent us in this thing? Now, it all sounds cool, right? It sounds really sounds good because they're doing really well and they're making all this money and they've gone from nothing to $16 billion. In assets. Now there's nothing. And all those same people are feeling like they got egg all over their face because they put their name out there. Let me tell you something. If you, you're saved, you are not to put your name in, in an endorsement to something that endorses somebody that's unsaved, an unbeliever. You've got to be very careful. If some of you decide to venture into politics, you better be very, very careful where you're going to go because it, it happens with most of the best people. Either it's going to morph you or you're going to morph it. Christians are not to be yoked together with unbelievers in evangelizing the world. There's a group right now called, that's known as the California Family Council. I'm letting you know this right now. Doing a good work up in Sacramento for family values and things. On the day of the midterm elections, they had a prayer meeting up there. So out of curiosity, I quick, did a quick scan down there on the message I got to see who they invited there. They had all these different groups going there that are not Christian at all. They had Catholics and other groups there on that. Christians cannot be yoked together with that. Cannot be yoked together with that. Okay? Uh, we, we cannot be yoked together with unbelievers. Hey, the Bible tells us we're not to, the Bible says we're to separate from angry men. Right. 
Make no friendship with an angry man. The Bible says we're to separate from sinful brethren, 1 Corinthians 5.11. The Bible says we're to separate from unruly men in 2 Thessalonians 3. I'm just saying today, there's a yoke of separation. Unbelievers and believers cannot be yoked together in certain endeavors. That not doesn't mean we're not to be friendly, we're not to approach them. It means it's talking about where we get to a closeness that is, that is too close and a closeness that could wind up violating the Bible principle. The Bible says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Righteousness cannot have fellowship with unrighteousness. Light cannot have fellowship with darkness there. George Washington said this as our first president. Associate with men of good quality if you, if you esteem your reputation, for it is better to be alone than in bad company. That was written by our first president. But then there's the yoke of sharing. There's a yoke of schooling. There's a yoke of separation. There's a yoke of suffering. But I want you to consider me the yoke of sharing. Now, the yoke was meant to be shared by two animals. The Bible tells us, and again, you can read through Galatians. Galatians represent, talks about the yoke of the law. In Galatians, Paul said this, bear ye one another's burdens. Now, Jeremiah carried his bonds and yoke for 14 years. We're not told if anybody else was next to him to help support that. Jeremiah felt pressure during that time. Much of that time he was carrying that. The false prophets gave a contradictory message to him. And much of that time, even in fact, we read, I think it's Jeremiah 25, they threatened to kill Jeremiah during that time. Well, now we get over here, and you go back to chapter 2 here. We were in chapter 27. And go back to chapter 26, and uh, the prophets here in chapter 26, they, they, just the prophets and princes and priests, they all want to kill Jeremiah. They want to go after him. And so uh, they're, they're just upset with him. And God gave a friend to, to Jeremiah. This friend was a burden bearer. You read this in chapter 26, verse 24. Nevertheless, the hand of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah, that they should not give him into the hand of the people to put him to death. Now, as this insurrection was given against Jeremiah, Jeremiah's still wearing this show. But it's interesting, God tells us, God gave him a friend at the right time. God gave him a burden bearer. I'm saying tonight, sometimes somebody else is wearing a yoke. God calls on you and I to, to share that burden with them. To put the bond around your neck and say, look, I'm going to come around to share that burden with you. Let me help carry that burden. Let me help you along the way there. God wants us to share. Just as a yoke on two oxen, they bore the burden together. And sometimes the yoke gets very heavy for someone else there. And by the way, the name Ahikam means this, my brother has arisen. Well, we've seen the prophecy. We've seen the practical. I have one last thought I want to give you tonight that just ties it all together. Do you notice the promise? And go with me over to Matthew chapter 11, please. Familiar passage dealing with the yoke. Jesus is about halfway through his three-year ministry, maybe closer towards his third year. He's now at this place of ministry where the cities he ministered to have rejected him. He's getting pushback, rejection. All along that time, while this is going on between Jesus and the Pharisees, the people along the way that are following him, they're feeling the heaviness of the yoke, the yoke of suffering, of being biased against and prejudiced against and being weighed down by the heavy laws of the Pharisees. And so Jesus comes to them, and he says this in Matthew 11, verse 28, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. The labor is speaking about there, trying to satisfy the, the, the laws of the Pharisees, the man-made tradition of the Pharisees. And you're burdened down. You just get one thing done. There's something else there. It just seems like you can't satisfy anyone. They're taxing you more. The Roman government's taxing you. And you've got family problems. And you've got, you've got spiritual problems and these things. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. He says, and I will give you rest. He says, now listen, they've tried, the Pharisees can't give you rest. And the Roman government can't give you rest. And he says, the society can't give you rest. And welfare can't give you rest. But he says, I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke. And as he mentioned that, the idea in their mind was, yeah, that's exactly what we're under right now, Jesus. We're feeling the heaviness of the yoke. We're feeling the burden of the yoke upon our shoulders and it's weighing us down. And we have nobody else here to support us. Nobody else here to sustain us. Kind of like Jeremiah did back in the day. And then he said, take my yoke upon you. And he said, learn of me. He said, now you've heard all their stuff. I want you to learn the right thing. Learn of me. Learn my doctrine. Learn my word. For he says, I am meek and lowly in heart. Why did he say that? Because the Pharisees were proud and obstinate and stubborn and coarse and crude and oppressive. 
What kind of leader do you want in your life? You want a leader that's meek and lowly in heart. You, want a, you don't want a leader that's going to dominate over you. You want a leader that looks, that looks over you and prays for you. Hey, that's what, by the way, that's one instruction we're given in spiritual leadership, that there are those who go out of the way and we're to go to them in the spirit of meekness. He says, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, he says here, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest in your soul. And for my yoke is easy, and my burden is life. Now, there are two things as we close. Number one, Jesus addressed the load the people were carrying. Their anxieties, their cares, their exhaustion, their overload, their problems, their weariness, their, their worry. And aren't you glad tonight Jesus says you may be carrying that yoke. He promises rest for your soul. Amen. He says, have faith in me. Come to me. Learn of me. Trust me. Trust me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Aren't you glad about that tonight? Amen. You're battling with anger, bitterness, malice, contention, unforgiveness. Take his yoke. His yoke is easy and it's light. Don't carry the weight of all these problems. Don't carry the weight of your frustration. Take his, come to him because he's meek and lowly in heart. You say, well, I'm getting pushback in my life and I'm getting pushback in my work and I'm getting rejection. Hey, come to Jesus. He said, I'm meek and lowly in heart and I will give you rest. You understand, Pastor, my melatonin levels are down and I'm not sleeping very well and I have sleepless nights and I'm tossing and turning because I've got all these cares and these worries. And he says, take my yoke upon you for my, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. He says, and I will give you rest. You say, I don't understand, Pastor, I've got all these worries. I don't understand, but he said he'll give you rest. You don't understand, Pastor, my mind is racing and I'm taking antidepressant medication. No, I don't understand, but I want to tell you tonight, Jesus is sovereign and Jesus is God and Jesus is greater than antidepressant medication. And Jesus said, I will give you rest. Rest is much different than relief. You give it to him, he wraps his cables of grace around you, and he gives you what he says, and I will give you rest. He addresses the load the people were carrying, but notice this, he was addressing the law the people were trying to satisfy for their eternal security. As I close, I want to say this, the law cannot save you from your sins. No code of law can save you. The Bible says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak, God sent forth his son in the likeness of man. The law cannot take away your sin. The law shows your sin. The law cannot take away your sin. Remember that. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can take away your sin. The law cannot give you forgiveness, but God gives you forgiveness. The law cannot get you to heaven, but Jesus can get you to heaven. Heavy laden people are overwhelmed with the requirements of the law for spiritual satisfaction. Only Jesus can save your soul. Amen. Faith in his shed blood, his death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead can save your soul. Jesus said, come to me. Come to me. There's salvation rest. There's eternal security rest. There's service rest. There's suffering rest. Listen, there's rest with Jesus Christ there. The yoke he promises. Now I wonder tonight, are you carrying a yoke that's heavy and you need his rest? Are you carrying the yoke of schooling? Are you, carrying the, are you participating in the yoke of sharing? Are you bearing one another's burdens? Are you practicing the yoke of separation, realizing that believers cannot be unequally yoked with unbelievers? There's a volume of things that God has given us tonight to remind us there that the yoke, and by the way, he says this in Jeremiah. Jeremiah went on to close off everything he had to say with the yoke. He said this for young men and young women. It's good for a young man to bear the, the yoke in his youth. It's good for you to have to carry some weight and to carry some burdens. And it's good for you to be involved in mentoring others. And it's good for you to be involved in those matters. It's good for you to come to Jesus because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. The invitation he gives is twofold. If you're not saved today, he invites you to receive him, to come to him, and he'll save you from your sins. The invitation tonight is if you're carrying unnecessary weights and burdens, let them go. Cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Realize tonight, you can take his yoke because his yoke is easy and his burden is light.